All right, good morning, everybody. Um, today we're talking about Watchmen. Um, for those who have the EP, we've had some of this talk before, but we're gonna go into a little bit more um, depth, especially towards the latter part of the talk. Um, um, thank you for, to uh, Rismar Squid for, um, for sponsoring today. Um, and uh, let's get going. First, let's see if we can, there, there's my disclosures. We're gonna start by talking about AFib and stroke, just kind of the association and treatment challenges, which is obviously the whole reason for this. We're gonna talk about uh, just a little bit of the device overview, some of the trials and data is gonna be a, the bulk of the talk and talking about the new device that we have as well. And a couple other slides, miscellaneous slides in there too. Why is it doing that? All right, so AFib and stroke. So it affects 6 million people and it's predicted to increase to 12 million by 2030. Has a five-fold increased risk of stroke or embolism if you have AFib and up to 18% risk annually. So um, I think as we talk about risk, I think it's really important as we talk through these trials, some of these people have that high of a risk per year. Um, they are embolic strokes, which are generally are more disabling than other mechanisms due to occlusion of larger arteries. So on a National Institutes of Health stroke severity scale, the average stroke scores a three, whereas an embolic stroke scores a nine, that's out of 30. Um, AFib is the most common cause of embolic stroke, about 45%. And we know from the <coughs> Crystal AF trial and a few other trials that uh, it's about a 30 to 40% of cryptogenic strokes have AFib as well. Um, anticoagulation, I guess aspirin is not really anticoagulation, but the largest trial I've ever seen is a 22% risk reduction. I usually think zero to 10% um, in most studies. Uh, warfarin reduces the risk of stroke about 65%, similar to DOAX, and has some mortality reduction as well. If you compare aspirin and clopidogrel versus warfarin, they have similar bleeding rates, but ischemic stroke rates generally higher um, with warfarin, depending on the trial, of course. All right, so we're all in this room pretty familiar with problems with anticoagulation. We'll go through it a little bit still. So obviously there's bleeding risks. You have to take the medicine daily very high non-adherence rates, complicate surgical procedures. Warfarin has tons of food and drug interactions. DOAX have some as well, but not as many. The regular INR monitoring is a burden for multiple reasons um, that we all experience. The direct oral anticoagulants, um, it's harder to get access to the reversal agents um, and they're often in the four and five figure range. Um, so as far as the reversal agents, and then there's also a high cost at baseline. Th this is kind of a busy slide, but I think it's an important one. So if you look at the bottom here, these are the numbers in the, the patient numbers. So that's a uh, very huge international registry. And up here you see, and this is the CHAD score, this is the CHAD's VAS score, and the patients who are on them. And so if you look at the top, this is no antibiotic, but no therapy at all. And this is aspirin. And this is aspirin plus Plavix. So most, so when we're at like uh, two and above or three and above in women, you know, this should, these bottom two colors should be close to hundred percent, but we basically never get above 50% for any CHADS VAS score. So um, that's worldwide. So um, when we talk about, oh, just put them on blood thinner, just realize the chance of that really happening is not, um, not the best. Um, this is, um, so, so this is talking about adherence up to two years. So this dotted line is warfarin and this is DOAX like Eliquis and Xarelto. Um, so um, warfarin, there's a up to 50% discontinuation rate at two years and um, the other uh, blood thinners are better, significantly better, but still 30% at two years, which is, um, you know, I think we often say, well, just put them on a DOAC. So often if they've been on warfarin, there's a, decent, there's a high chance that they might not be on it two years later. Um, so long-term bleeding risks, 
So use that has bled score, it's becoming more and more common. Um, this chart kind of extrapolates this annual bleeding risk, assuming that their um, risk doesn't become any higher. So we're going like when they're 65, this is their bleeding risk. And theoretically it's the same as when they're at 75. And if you extrapolate that, it doesn't take much for this to start to become a pretty high 10 year bleeding risk. I thought this was kind of an interesting study looking at oral anticoagulation in falls. It was looking at a big nationwide readmission database. And they found that people who had a falls, there was about a 5% readmission rate within six months um, for a recurrent fall with 9% of them being on oral anticoagulation. And interestingly, the rate of bleeding was not different if they were on oral anticoagulation or not. So their bleeding rates were the same, but the mortality if they were on oral anticoagulation was three times as high. And so just again, emphasizing uh, these are not benign drugs. I know we all see that, but uh, the Aristotle trial, um, looking at apixaban versus warfarin, looking at non-intracranial bleeding, th th those were the risks of death. If you had intracranial bleeding, I mean, we don't see hazard ratios of 120 plus very often. Um, and you know, that's, uh, but we do see them in our clinic. And so the ones who survive that. And so that's, um, and this is not, you know, a year's kind of thing. This is days. So, you know, the people that you can think about when we're thinking about not suitable for long-term oral anticoagulation, I think it's worth taking a few minutes on this slide. You know, overt bleeding, we all know that. Um, increased bleeding risks, so GI lesions, inflammatory bowel disease, uncontrolled seizures, fall risk, significant thrombocytopenia, need for lifelong uh, DAPT, um, dual antiplatelet therapy, medical contraindications such as a GFR less than 30, um, not on dialysis, uh, medication allergy, low time and therapeutic range. Um, if you look at our Coumadin clinic, there's probably five patients per day at least that are in the low therapeutic range, if not 10. And um, um, other contraindications, so li lifestyle occupational bleeding risks, pilots, manual laborers, um, extreme sports, medical or social reasons, especially with you know, elderly patients, dementia, um, as a separate thing. So these are all things you could consider a watchman for. Um, we have done a few for people who've had recurrent strokes on anticoagulation um, and just continued anticoagulation, but helped with putting in a device. All right, so why the left atrial appendage? So in 1949, we had the first surgical left atrial appendage closure. 1987, they did the, you know, it was the Cox maze procedure with ablation and closure again. Kind of the seminal paper in 96 was Blackshear and Odell. They did surgical autopsy and T data that um, said 90% of thrombi in the left atrial appendage for non valvular fib, 57% in valvular fib. And that's where a lot of the guidelines, the way, the reason they uh, focus on non valvular fib for, uh, for watchmans. So the first percutaneous left atrial appendage closure was in 2001, so 20 years ago. 2005, the Watchman trials were initiated. 2015 was when, watch, when FDA, when the FDA approved the Watchman. Um, and it's still the only one that's fully FDA approved. Um, in Europe, there are other devices. In 2019, greater than 100,000 uh, were implanted worldwide. Um, and that continues to grow. So this is the first generation Watchman device made of nitinol, which is nickel and titanium, covered by PTFE. If anybody wants to try to pronounce that, they're welcome to. Um, so it has 10 anchors and five sizes. A couple things that have been issues as, uh, as we've continued to do this. One is this threaded insert. So this is what, atta what um, attaches the Watchman um, to the sheath until you release it, this sticks out a little bit. And so it can be either confused for clot on a TE later, or it can be a nidus for clot later. The other is that there are 10 kind of struts. And so when this compresses within the device, it can lead to a little bit of um, 
a few valleys between those struts that can actually lead to some of the leaks that we have. Um, and so um, we're gonna, and then the other is that these anchors, you see that they're just sharp edges and they, um, they are fairly safe in this configuration, but when it's compressed in the device and you're first unsheathing it, these kind of stick straight out. So that um, those are things that we're gonna see later have been improved on the next device. Um, the other is that um, this requires about the same amount of depth in the appendage as the width. And so that can be a, um, that can be an issue uh, as far as if you have a wide appendage and not enough depth, then it's this, the older device sometimes you couldn't do, uh, couldn't do a watchman. This is a couple examples of dog hearts and human hearts. Um, think the, uh, so, you know, this is an appendage. This is kind of a schematic of what it looks like um, in the appendage. This is an actual cross section. And this is what it would look like looking from inside the uh, atrium out. So that's what, you know, this is obviously, sorry, this is obviously our goal right here. So the Watchman procedure usually takes less than an hour. I think for most of us, probably skin to skin, it's for most procedures, it's less than 30 minutes. They continue oral anticoagulation for six weeks. They do, we do a T at six weeks. If it looks okay, no significant leaks, no clot. Um, aspir we do aspirin and clopidogrel for four and a half months and then only aspirin. Um, more than 92% of patients are off anticoagulation by six weeks more than 99% by one year, less than, and a less than 2% procedure related complication rate. So uh, CMS requirements. Um, so we often talk about a CHADS VAS score of three and above, three, uh, three plus. A CHADS score of two plus can, so if they have hypertension and diabetes and they're 50, they still do qualify. Um, and basically they say you have to have an appropriate rationale to seek non-pharmacologic, a non-pharmacological uh, alternative to long-term oral anticoagulation. And who decides what the appropriate rationale is? It's the physician, the patient, and then an, and both an implanting physician and a non-implanting physician have to agree to that. Um, if you're referring for a watchman, it is helpful to say, um, hey, we're, I, I think this might be indicated or might be reasonable, it can save them a visit. It, it, of course, that's if you think that that's true. Um, I did not spend a lot of time putting table one tables in here. It's just, but um, so if you wanna squint, feel free. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> um, but uh, so the first trial that was ever done was the, this uh, first randomized control trial was the PROTECT AF trial. It's 707 non-valvular AFib patients at 59 hospital with, hospitals with a mean follow-up of about four years. The primary, primary efficacy endpoint was stroke, systemic embolism, cardiovascular unexplained death, primary safety endpoint, procedure-related complications, and major bleeding events. And so here are the Kaplan-Meier curves on that. For the primary efficacy endpoint, um, the device did reach statistical significance. Um, for the efficacy endpoint. And for the safety endpoint, um, as they went out, the curves are coming together, the device was higher. And so this, of all the trials that are done, this had the, which had the highest um, safety issues, um, as you can tell by this kind of spike at the beginning, um, that got better through, as this trial went on and as future trials went forward, as would be expected with a, um, a device trial. Um, looking a little bit more into that. So ischemic stroke, they were very similar. Um, for cardiovascular mortality, it did reach statistical significance in favor of the device. Um, all cause mortality, same thing. So it did have the highest complication rate of any other, any of the major trials for, for uh, left atrial appendage closure. It did meet non-inferiority criteria versus warfarin. There were more early events with the device group, more bleeding events with the warfarin group, as you would expect. Um, this is just another way of looking at it. Um, so looking at <laughs> stroke, ischemic stroke, this is odds ratios, 
hemorrhagic stroke, much lower chance of hem having a hemorrhagic stroke or disabling stroke or death. So if you look at these endpoints, those are the ones that I would be most concerned about. And there's even a suggestion of superiority here. So pr the PREVAIL trial was the next trial and the FDA basically said, we're concerned about the safety things at the beginning. We want you to include higher risk patients and we wanna see, okay, it's nice that you have better numbers, but the um, early on there was more complicated more complications. So can you train new operators so that it's not so high? And so they basically took the prevail, uh, the protect AF patients, they added some prevail patients, they did a two to one randomization. They did end up having a higher CHAD score, uh, 3.8 versus 2.2, which is a pretty significant step up. About 40% were new sites and uh, new operators. Um, and this is kind of the, the endpoints and the results. So the first efficacy endpoint was stroke, systemic embolism, and cardiovascular unexplained death. And there was no statistical difference. So that's great um, for the watchman. Um, did not, it did not meet non-inferiority because of an unexpectedly low event rate in the warfarin arm. So it was a very large confidence interval. I'll show you the numbers in the, in the next slide. <clears throat> the second efficacy endpoint, stroke or systemic embolism greater than seven days non-inferior. And then looking at that safety endpoint, all-cause death, ischemic stroke, systemic embolism, or major device or procedure-related events within seven days of the procedure. 2.2% event rate during a median follow-up of 12 months. So that's a pretty big drop compared to the last one that was over eight. This is what I was talking about. So in a lot of the trials, the event rates um, you know, were in this range where it was 0.7 in the prevail trial. So that made it and with a crazy large confidence interval. So, um, so that, you know, that, uh, so if, you know, if the numbers had been more in line with this, it would have been non-inferior because of this. So it is the lower, uh, lower complication rate than protect AF so it showed that you could train new operators and centers. It was non-inferior for prevention of late ischemic events and Primary efficacy endpoints were similar between both arms, but only thromboembolism reached achieved non inferiority. I think this is a help, helpful um, slide. So, um, so, this is the Protect AF and Prevail meta analysis. Um, this also includes their respective registries. Um, and so, 2,406 patients. And, you know, we're used to these graphs. Basically, I want to have you eyes focus on the ones that do not cross the line, the ones that are actually considered statistically significant. So hemorrhagic stroke, fivefold decrease um, risk of hemorrhagic stroke of the watchman, disabling stroke, sorry, also statistically significant, about half the risk, cardiovascular unexplained death, 40% reduction, um, all cause death, 27% reduction, major bleeding not related to the procedure, um, 40, 52% uh, reduction. So these are, um, as I said before, of the ones that I care about the most, if it was me or my family member, those are the ones that um, seem to show uh, the most benefit. And that played out in a lot of other trials as well. Um, all right, between these two trials, there was this trial called called the ASAP study. Um, it's non-randomized prospective trial of 150 non-valvular AFib patients that were considered ineligible for warfarin. And they just wanted to say, well, we know we're gonna be putting this in a lot of people have contraindications for oral anticoagulation. Is this reasonable? And so they put them on basically aspirin and Plavix for six months and then lifelong aspirin. Um, these were people who just could not be on blood thinners, on uh, oral anticoagulation. Chad's vascular was high, I mean follow up a little over a year. And the ischemic stroke rate, despite being on aspirin and Plavix, was about 1.7% per year with a 77% risk reduction. As I said, this was early on. This was not after this last trial. And so um, there was a higher rate of safety events that, um, that have not played out in further trials. Um, they did have six, these DRTs, device-related thrombi. So at, post, uh, at that 45-day T, seeing clots on the device. Uh, one did result in a stroke, so one out of 150 patients. Um, but uh, um, 
So anyway, that's that. Okay. So then the question then became, well, how about in the real real world? Because um, these patients aren't people who just come to you and say, well, I will be on warfarin or I'll be on this, right? They tend to be patients that go, I want to get off warfarin because I had a brain bleed. Um, so, or, yeah, so what does it look like to, what did it look like in the real world? So in, this was a study in Europe, um, an observational study, 47 centers, 13 countries, um, lots of new implanters, um, and a uh, high chads vask high has blood score. And what they found is only 27% were really on oral anticoagulation and a large number of those were uh, were on DOAX. So 16% of the total population was on warfarin. So, and so the question is, how did that look? Did they do well? Did they not do well? Um, and so it was a 2.8% device or procedure related serious adverse events through seven days post procedure. 2.2% um, for oral anticoagulation. People were ineligible for oral anticoagulation. So that, those are really good low, uh, low numbers. Um, this is a chart looking at on the y-axis is ischemic stroke, TIA, systemic embolism. The red is um, what you'd expect that those numbers to be based on their Chad's VASC, and then the green is what they actually saw. So overall, 80% relative risk reduction. If they had a history of stroke, TIA, hemorrhagic stroke, or major bleed, again, just 70 to 80% reductions. Um, and this is two-year outcomes data. Two-year bleeding outcomes, um, similar. So if, so there was about a, overall in the uh, study, there was a 50% or 46% uh, relative risk reduction in the risk of bleeding. If you had a history of stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, major bleed, there was also very significant uh, reductions. And so, um, so that was very encouraging for all of us who do these that we weren't, if we didn't put them on warfarin forever, that it, we weren't, um, the data suggested that would be safe, uh, relatively safe. Um, so there was no significant correlation between type of anticoagulation and the events. Um, there was a trend towards lower bleeding rates with, the sh with shorter dual antiplatelet therapy. So three months versus six months. Um, so actually the European guidelines are different than the US guidelines where we do six months of anti, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, Europe does, does three. Um, they did have about a 4% rate of device related thrombi. Um, importantly, that was very similar to the trials that included warfarin. So there doesn't seem to be a, uh, based on this study, there didn't seem to be a very much increased risk of thrombi on the device. Um, there are smaller studies that agree and disagree with that. Um, but, and then what was interesting to me is that almost 40%, they saw the clot and they just said, well, we'll watch. And they didn't actually treat the clot any differently. Um, and they, on their repeat T's, they, the clots went away no, and throw no thromboembolic events. Oops, sorry, I skipped that. Um, there has been, so this is uh, after it was approved, there was a post FDA approval um, study. Um, and so looking at the aggregate data of all these trials, these are the registries that go with these two trials. So out of 6,700 procedures, 95% success rate, took about 50 minutes to do. Um, these are the complication rates. So around a 1% risk of tamponade, most two thirds of which could be treated with pericardiocentesis. Some people did go to surgery. Um, so procedure related strokes, 0.2%, um, device embolization, 0.2%, procedure related mortality, 0.06%. So if this, this is another way of looking at that, looking at the complication rates, they started higher with Protect AF, and as we went down, really the overall complication rates in the US cohort, that being that post FDA approval study and the evolution study is less than 2%. Um, just looking at some of the higher risk populations. So there, there were some sub studies or other studies that looked at people with a really high CHADS-VAS score. 
there was a relative risk stroke, stroke risk reduction, 77% here, major bleeding, stroke risk reduction, and bleeding risk reduction, chronic kidney disease reductions. How about people who are over 75? Good reduction, 85. Stroke risk reduction of 80%. So, um, so they have looked at some of these higher risk populations and they've done uh, pretty well considering we're doing procedures on. This is our results, our results up to this point. So we've done, we've scheduled 306. 11 were not done due to the left atrial appendage anatomy. A lot of them we didn't open up a device for. Some were and we realized it uh, wasn't doable. Um, one was stopped actually just this earlier this month due to thrombus or last month, I guess. Uh, one was uh, Dr. Hoskins had fun with an interrupted IVC that couldn't, so there was no connection between the right atrium and the IVC. Um, <laughs> makes it hard to get in there. And so um, 293 successful implants uh, over the last four years. Um, more, more than 98% are off oral anticoagulation in one year. We've had 1% complication rate. So we've had one groin hematoma, one pseudoaneurysm, one effusion. Um, none of those went to surgery. Uh, we had uh, pericardial effusion um, at 10 days. Um, we've had uh, some strokes and TIAs not immediately after the procedure, but one at a hemorrhagic stroke at four months, stroke at five months, TIA at 11 months, and one GI bleed within a year of the procedure. Um, if you look at the complication rate of that, that's actually really good out of 306 patients. Um, we often talk about leaks. So the um, leak rate is about 25% of any sort of leak. In the trials, uh, they considered a significant leak greater than, as being greater than five millimeters. So we are at 0.7%. Uh, um, and, then the, and then our device related throm thrombi 4.1%, all are off antiquated anticoagulation now, and none of them were the ones that had stroke, TIA, or systemic embolism. So I think we should be, as a group here, I think a lot of people in the room here have been involved in this and pretty intimately. So we should be pretty proud of this, I think. This is uh, lower than lower rates than normal um, than most programs. Um, these are things we want to continue to improve on, and I think the next generation device should help us with that. We're going to get there in a minute. All right, so some, for those of you who've heard this before, we've this is the new stuff. So, um, so some questions. So how about left atrial appendage closure versus the new or the direct oral anticoagulants like Eliquis, Sorelto? Um, what, what do we do with leaks? Uh, what do we do with device-related thrombi? Um, how, how about you know, left atrial appendage closure versus no oral, oral anticoagulation or comparison between different types of left atrial appendage devices? And then what is the optimal post-implant regimen? These are some things we're gonna talk about or at least say what's, how are we gonna find those out if we don't know the data yet? So compared to warf warfarin, uh, DOAX um, and left atrial appendage closure devices both reduce hemorrhagic stroke and reduce mortality. So it's a fair question of saying, well, you haven't really done a study comparing it to DOAX. And so should we, um, Maybe if you do it to DOAX, the left atrial, the risk of a watchman is higher than the risk of um, another blood thinner. So you know the guess, bef you know, before you do the study is probably you know a, a device will have a lower, longer, long-term risk of bleeding, but the procedural complication risks are substantially higher. Whereas with a DOAX, there's more GI bleeding than warfarin, and likely longer, long-term risk of bleeding is eventually higher. Um, but, you know, there's no procedure involved, and that's significant. So this was uh, the only other randomized control trial that's been done on left atrial appendage closure, so, and it was looking to answer this. Interesting, it's called the PROG-17 trial. Anybody know why it was called PROG-17? It was done in Prague in 2017. It's fine. <laughs> um, Partially, actually. So 10 of the studies, uh, ten of the, there were 10 sites and they were all in Czechoslovakia. Um, and they were, um, and it was in 2015 to 19. So multi-center uh, multi randomized non-inferiority trial. Um, and they, the recommended post 
regimen was aspirin and clopidogrel for three months. Um, the inclusion criteria was non-valvular AFib, history of bleeding requiring intervention or hospitalization, history of cardioembolic events while on oral anticoagulation, and a CHADS vascular three or more has blood of two or more. The primary composite endpoint, this is kind of a mouthful, so stroke TIA systemic <laughs> embolism, so um, cardiovascular death, major or non-major clinically relevant bleeding, and procedure-related or device-related complications, looking at all that together. Because um, here we go. Um, 201 patients got either an amulet or a watchman. So amulet is um, the St. Jude version of a watchman. Um, and, uh, and then 201 were DOAC patients. And there was a crossover of 14 patients that said, no, nah, um, actually, I think I, yeah, 14, the 14 patients said, oh, no, I don't want a device. I'm going to do DOAC. Um, the median follow-up was about 20 months. The CHADS VAS score, again, high, has blood score, high, um, higher rate of complications than other recent trials. So I think that's an important thing. So 40% were new implanting centers that have never, never done a device. And 60%, the other 60% had uh, done a mean of 19 devices. So these were very um, inexperienced centers. Um, six patients though, out of 400, ended up having device, well, out of 200, had device related thrombi, five resolved within four weeks and none of them had any sort of events. Four patients with greater than five millimeter leak. So, um, so there was, but there was no difference in the primary or secondary outcomes, which are shown here. So that primary outcome, which we said that strokes and mortality and bleeding and complications from the device, um, looking at all that together, uh, it was there was no difference between DOAX and left atrial appendage closure. Um, looking at so, um, looking at the the secondary endpoints, we're basically just trying to look at each one individually, each area individually. And this is a relatively small study, not powered to find differences very well. Um, but no difference at stroke or TIA. Sorry, differences in these individual things very well because of the low event rates. Um, so stroke, TIA, no difference, cardiovascular death, no difference, bleeding, no difference, non-procedure bleeding trended that way, but didn't reach statistical significance. My personal bias is probably a year later, there would have been some statistical if you were following them for another year. Um, that seems to be how it's trending. Um, so that, that's the, what we have right now of a randomized controlled trial comparing DOACs with um, with left atrial finish closure. So peri-device leaks. So um, the two, the first, the protect and prevail basically define significant leaks is greater than five millimeters. Um, the leak rate is somewhere between, was somewhere between 12 and 41% at, depending on which study you believe, um, that's any size leak. So less than one millimeter that would count in that, those numbers. And again, ours is about 25%. Um, the relevance and management is really controversial. It's hard to do studies on this. Um, and, uh, but the thought is that it may lead to the inability of the left atrial appendage to fully thrombose. Some studies like the retrospective anal analysis of Protect AF said there's no clinical sig statistical significance between those who have leaks and those who don't. And some studies say they do. Um, there was a meta-analysis of 18 publications looking at closing those leaks, and they were just looking at safety. Um, and there's a less than 3% complication rate. Um, so that's considered reasonable for a lot of implanters and others say, well, why don't you just leave it alone? And that's the area of um, debate. And here we, um, here it kind of, we discuss amongst the, three to five of us and um, think through the particular patients. All right, so this is the new Watchman Flex device. This is what we are implanting now. Um, so a few, so there's uh, multiple advantages to this device over the previous one. Um, it can 
be implanted in a widened range of appendages. So it's shorter and wider, which means it can fit those that are short and wide um, as opposed to the previous device. Um, you can fully recapture it. So in the old device, if you put it back in the sheath fully, it destroyed the device enough that you had to take it away, take it out and put a new one in. This one, you can put it back in the sheath a thousand times and it's uh, and move it back and forth and it should be okay. Um, if you remember the old device did not, so this is the tip of this device. The old device had um, splines that kind of stuck out. And so we talked about when it comes out of the sheath that it is a little bit of like a spear. And so this one is soft, much, much softer, almost, I'd say almost spongy. And so um, uh, that's a technical term. Um, but uh, but as far as a, uh, um, so I, we think that the perforation risk would be lower. The um, this we showed you the threaded insert on the last one. This one it's covered, and so I think less chance of a clot forming with that. Also, there are eighteen of these kind of struts, and so there's less of the valleys between the. Um, uh, between the device, uh, but between the struts. In other words, it might, uh, or it's thought that it would reduce leaks. And we're gonna see some of the data behind that. Um, and so- It's pretty cool, right? Like the device pulls the, pulls the appendage into the, shape of the, right. into the shape of the wash. Right, Sean's making the point that the device the kind of pulls the appendage in the shape of the wash. In other words, it, it makes an oval um, ostium, um, circular. So over time, uh, they, they go back and they look and actually the appendage reshapes itself to the device, uh, which is, uh, was not the case with the last one. So um, this was the study of this device, the called the Pinnacle Flex trial, multi-center perspective, non-randomized. Um, 400 patients with a CHADS VASC of 4.2. Um, 98.8% primary efficacy, you know, endpoint. Um, and so that's closure with no leak greater than five, milli, mil, five millimeters at 45 days. Um, so 98.8. 90% of the devices of these 400 patients um, had no detectable leak at all, which is, uh, if you remember before, we were talking about 12 to 41% had some leak. Um, there were 1.2% that were not implanted due to still anatomic uh, limitations. Um, the prim primary safety endpoint was 0.5%. Uh, death, stroke, systemic embolism, procedure related events. Uh, seven had device related thrombi. In the other studies, uh, in a lot of studies, it was somewhere between, it was around 4% with the older device. Um, no effusions requiring cardiac surgery, no embolizations. Um, I will say this is 400 patients. I'm still telling people less than 2% complication rate as opposed to less than one. But, uh, but you know, this, uh, these numbers, at least this preliminary numbers are a significant improvement from the old device. So, and it makes um, logical sense based on uh, how the device was designed. All right, so there are, so there are only three current randomized control trials that have been done. Um, so we talked about the Protect AF, the Prevail, and the, um, uh, the, the, the Prog 17 trial. Uh, there are a ton in the pipeline for, um, for left atrial appendage closure. So, um, except for this first one, which I thought was worth mentioning. So the ASAP2 trial, you remember there was the ASAP trial before that was just aspirin and Plavix, for people who were intolerant oral anticoagulation, well, they said, well, let's do an ASAP-2 trial with closure with antiplatelet versus just antiplatelet only for patients ineligible for oral anticoagulation. And it was stopped early due to low enrollment. So basically, a lot of investigators would look at the patient and go, I could either put a watchman in you like the rest of the world does, or I could randomize you to being on aspirin or aspirin and Plavix or just Plavix, which we know is inferior to blood thinners. And, is, and so a lot of uh, investigators were not enrolling because they felt like they were putting people in a, uh, they didn't feel like the two arms were equivalent um, because the data has been strong with the 
appendage closure. Um, so um, anyway, it would have been nice to see the results of that trial, but um, I understand the reason of stopping it and the reason for low enrollment. Um, the, there are other trials comparing the amulet device from St. Jude and the washroom device from Boston Scientific. So uh, those next two, the Am Platzer amulet left atrial appendage occluder trial and the Swiss Apero trial. Um, and uh, when I say Washman slash flex, it can be either one of those. The catalyst trial is amulet versus uh, DOAC. Um, and so that um, is a, I started that just because it is a trial uh, that we are currently in conversations about whether we want to do that here. Um, and so uh, I think we, I don't know, we'll probably have a meeting sometime in the near future with them to talk about possibly doing that. So that could be, so it'd be nice to also be bringing amulet to our patients and have options. Um, and then, uh, and this trial would expand it. It would be people who are DOAC eligible. And so it might be, um, there's some advantages to um, our, our practice and our patients for that possibly. Um, all right, so the, several of these other trials are, well, what should be the anticoagulation afterwards or antiplatelet? So the Andes and Adala trials, um, so that's how you say them, uh, short-term DOAC versus short-term dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, the SAFE left atrial appendage closure trial is one month versus six months of dual antiplatelet therapy. Aspirin, left atrial appendage occlusion, they said, well, how about, do we really need long-term aspirin or can we just discontinue it after the six months? Which is a fair question. My guess is we can discontinue it, but we'll find out. And then the stroke close trial, they took hemorrhagic, they're gonna take, they are taking hemorrhagic stroke patients and they're randomizing them to left atrial appendage closure versus medical therapy. Um, and that's the, the medical therapies based on what the, um, what the physician thinks is appropriate. Um, and we'll see what that shows um, based on the meta-analyses before we expect that to be a favor left atrial finish closure, but we'll see. So if you uh, take home, um, atrial fibrillation is a high annual stroke risk. And I think it's really important to remember that's an annual stroke risk. So when we talk about Watchman or any of these devices, we're talking about a one time less than 2% risk versus an annual stroke risk, even if it's 5% is still significant. Um, and its strokes are larger and more disabling than the average stroke. Many patients are not suitable for long-term oral anticoagulation. Um, the Watchman device reduces stroke risk without needing long-term lifelong anticoagulation has with less mortality than warfarin. So more than 99% are off their blood thinners by a year, less than a 2% complication rate. We are now using um, the next generation device, the Watchman Flex device. Um, all of our implanters have been using it. Um, and, uh, and that the randomized controlled rate, data suggests it further improves the efficacy and safety of this procedure. Um, I have a few minutes. I'm just gonna show one more slide that I plan to, so as far as cost effectiveness, <laughs> somebody will ask that, right? So by year three, uh, left atrial appendage closure patients had more quality adjusted life years than warfarin patients. Um, it's cost effective relative to warfarin at year seven and dominant at 10 years, Co which is the least expensive is often warfarin. So I think that's dominant at 10 years is impressive. Um, left atrial appendage what the closure was cost effective and dominant relative to uh, no acts or do acts at year five. So it's really not only cost effective, but cost saving um, in the long run. Um, so uh, thank you. The point I would make about devices in general, right, is that we, we tend to reserve them too long or too late for patients because the, the longer you have a device in place that provides you benefit, the more benefit you get, right? right. The device doesn't get any more risk in health, the longer it's in there. Whereas the blood thinner has kind of a steady rate of deteriorating right. long in fact, the chances of bleeding get higher and higher as you get older and older. Right. Whereas the, the benefit That's right. It's, it's interesting. Device, device therapy in general, we use too late. In the yeah. Process. 
Sean's making the point that we often use devices too late in the disease process because the they have a one-time um, one-time risk, whereas a lot of the you know the bleeding risk is a time-based risk, and so the longer you live, the more risk the blood thinners are. And so if you wait too long, um, you're not getting really the benefit uh, that you could. I would add to that that the bleeding risk is something that the mortality is a mortality benefit. Right. On the order of 25%. Yeah. You know, that's the equivalent to the fibrillator. Right. Mortality. So, and Mike Hoskins has made the point that the mortality benefit, I mean, it's not just a bleeding benefit, it's a mortality benefit. Um, of, you know, he's quoting 25%. I think some of the trials are actually more than that. And so, and the, um, you know, that's equivalent to even, you know, the reason we put defibrillators in is for a similar amount of benefit. Any other questions or comments? <laughs> Yeah, the picture on the right is throwing me off too. Yeah. I think that's yeah, the stars are the only one that looks. <laughs> anybody else any questions from uh anybody on zoom no. all right there are eight right now all right thanks everybody Appreciate it.